Hey, what is up? It's John Nelson, and this is the Starting Block Podcast. This is a show that's going to cut through the confusion, the outdated methods, and the marketing gimmicks of this industry. So our team has 65 years of combined on the floor in the trenches, real world experience with complete athletic development. And we're here to share that knowledge with you and those experiences with you and give you the tools for the athlete, the coach and the parents to win. So welcome. If you're new to the show, we're glad to have you here. And here's how our show breaks down. We basically have three, maybe four types of episodes, all right? So the first type of episode is uh, the soup of the day or the soup du jour. That uh, is obviously an ode to a dumb and dumber there. Um, but this is going to be the most common type of episode that we have. So this is going to be where our team will break down a topic related to athletic development. Um, it may be training. It may be rehab. It may be nutrition. Uh, or it may just be whatever we feel like talking about for that day. Um, the second type of episode is a Q&A. Now, in the Q&A episodes, uh, you guys will submit the questions and we will give you the answers. So you can submit the questions to info at EliteLevelPerformance.com. Thank you, Mandy. And uh, yeah, with these episodes, we'll typically take about three questions that you guys submitted um, and we'll break them down. Um, usually one is going to be strength related. One's going to be speed related. Um, we may have a nutrition or rehab based question in there. Um, and when you submit them, um, we'll talk about them on the show and we're going to give you an understanding of how to help you in those. And the goal is not just to give you an answer, but actually give you something that you can take home and apply to your daily life. Uh, again, whether you're the athlete, the parent, or the coach itself, and something you can take to your team, to your family, to help in that complete athletic development. Um, and then the other type of episode, the third type is going to be an interview style. So the interview style, if you've listened to any podcast ever. This is basically what everybody does. Um, you know, they're going to bring in somebody and they're going to interview them and talk about it. Uh, and we will have those episodes uh, as well. Um, we're going to bring in different guests from our network um, across the world. Um, and we're going to interview them and uh, we're going to learn how they go about things. We're going to hear about their success stories, uh, you know, and their viewpoints on how to dominate on and off the field. And I will tell you, we have an unbelievable guest lineup uh, right now. We are already booked out, I believe, almost until uh, December. Um, and so we'll be releasing some of those episodes here shortly after we finish interviewing these people. Man, it's, uh, it is going to be one heck of an interview um, guest list for sure. And then the fourth type of episode. Um, fourth type is basically just uh, me getting on here and ranting. So sometimes, uh, you know, it may be five minutes, sometimes it may be 20 minutes, but sometimes I just feel like there's a message that I need to get out of my brain. And, uh, you know, I want to uh, share that with you guys. Um, and so, you know, today's episode is going to be the soup of the day. And uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, here as usual with my kick-ass co-host, Chris Scarborough from what's Birmingham. What's up, bro? What's up? What's up? Good to see you guys. Uh, hey, good to talk to you as well, man. Good to talk to you as well. Um, so let's go ahead and get going. We got a lot to go over today, a lot to cover. So, uh, yeah, Mandy hit us. What's the, uh, what's the soup du jour? Ah, uh, well, the soup of the day is stretching versus mobility. Let's or go. Let's add in flexibility. What's, let's go. What's the difference? Um, so I'm gonna let you guys tackle that one. Right. That's a pretty hot button topic there, like really hot button topic. Um, all right. So I guess, you know, we need to start with what the difference is in flexibility versus mobility. So the two are pretty, dis they have two pretty distinct differences. I think it's very common for everybody to just say, oh, hey, something's tight and I need to you know, stretch that out. Um, but basically, I think in Chris, you know, you, you tell me how you feel about it. Flexibility, as I usually equate it, is to being able to just go down, touch your toes, right? You know, being able to go down, touch your toes, that's kind of what flexibility looks like. Mobility is going to be more capsule or joint capsule related, but it is in simplistic terms more, can you actually get into a squat? That's how I look at it. Right. Range of motion you can use. Yeah. Usable range of motion. Yes. Yep. Yes. Right. Yep. I would agree. So, yeah. Okay. So between those two and you've got an athlete saying, oh, I need to get flexible. How do you direct them from there? How do you change their their thinking on that? Well, I, I usually 
I usually will start out and saying like, okay, you know, asking obviously what, what they feel is, you know, is not flexible. And then honestly, I'll ask them if they're stretching. And usually people will be like, Oh, I don't stretch like I should. And usually I just keep my mouth shut. I don't, I don't say anything, but you know, inside, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of laughing and they're like, actually, I don't want you to be stretching. Um, you know, and, and then it kind of breaks down as to we, I, at least I will go into the, why is it tight? Like nothing is ever just tight like that. It doesn't work that way. Like there is a, a restriction in the, in the tissue for a reason, a, like a protective reason, namely, you know, and I know Chris, you and I were talking about, you know, that protective kind of stance, you know, and, and why something goes into that. I mean, and, and go, I mean, you can interrupt me. Cause I know you, you know, I know you were just talking about this the other day. Right. Well, <clears throat> Once you see something and you witness it with your own eyes, it's hard to unsee it, right? So oh, yeah. I was, um, this would have been about 10 years ago or so, and I went to a course. Uh, it, it's currently now, uh, now known as uh, RPR, Reflex Performance Reset. It was not yeah, called Reflex Performance Reset, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was called something different uh, then, but it was the same course um, or basically the same course. Well, there was a gentleman there. In fact, one of the hosts had, um, I believe, had had a motorcycle wreck or something where he had very limited shoulder range of motion on one side. And it had been limited for, I don't know, 30 years. I, I mean, let's just say he probably had 120 or so degrees of active shoulder flexion. All right. Basically, he's well short of what he should be. So uh, the norm is about 170 to 180 degrees, and he was about 120-ish, give or take. Well, in ten, keep in mind, again, 30-year or so uh, old injury. In 10 minutes, uh, he pretty much had 160, 165 degrees. Now, he retained that ability also because I had uh, traded uh, emails with him sometime later. And uh, he's like, yeah, I still... I still have all that range, you know, still. So clearly, he had been stretching. He had tried to get that range back. He had tried all the the, uh, the traditional methods, I guess you would say, stretching, if you will. And, and he never was able to retain the mobility. Yet in this 10-minute treatment, he did. You know, what was the difference? Well, I think you just hit on it a minute ago. There was some... His body his brain was holding on to that tightness for some reason even though there was no longer an injury in that shoulder it had long since healed but there was something his brain was saying okay there's a threat here and it perceived you know taking the arm over his head or in that direction it perceived a threat and so it shut the range down at about 120 or so degrees of flexion threat was removed and uh, or at least reduced and uh, now he's able to get 160, 165 degrees. And, you know, that's significant. That's a that's a life-changing range of motion, you know? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the perception of threat is really one of the, you know, one of the things that's missed a lot when it comes to flexibility. I mean, you know, you hear you hear doctors or PTs or chiros or, or whoever, you know, or, or coaches say, okay, well, you know, something is, is tight and we have to stretch it out. I mean, I literally had somebody actually come in the other day and say that their, their back, their back pain was because of their hamstrings that they were tight. And it's like, it, I, just, I still can't believe that that type of stuff is going on. Um, but anyway, the point of that is the perception of threat and ultimately what that means, you know, it's important that you, we understand that our our brain regulates everything. Like our nervous system regulates everything from top to bottom. But we have been very conditioned to believe that, okay, we have to attack the physical side of stuff all the time. So like, you know, knee hurts. I got to, you know, I got to work on knee. Got to, got to strengthen the quad up. Got, got to do all that stuff. And there are physical properties that are important, but ultimately it's the nervous system that is going to regulate everything that is going on around there. And so, yes, if you have an injury, like you tear your ACL or something, then yeah, there's going to clearly be a perception of threat and something's going to get tight, of course. But just in the general population or like an athlete who is who has tight hamstrings, right? Like 
looking into the underlying factors of why those are tight with the understanding that, okay, the brain is making these tight for a reason. And so what different types of stressors you play a role in that? Well, I, I think, I think the simplest one to look at is, you know, everybody would want to go into overtraining like, Oh yeah, yeah. I've, you know, I've, I've worked out a lot or I've played and practice. And so I'm tight. All right. You know, then, then they'll go into a, what Chris, like, Oh, I, I don't stretch enough. And right. that's why. And so for some, for some reason, our body's natural default is to be tight. Like, I don't understand where that came from. Like, no, I mean, our natural default mechanism is not to be tight. So don't know where that started. But then I think you got to go deeper into um, like societal norms. So like what in society has now gotten us to the point where we are so unbelievably stressed all the time, not just from a physical side of it, but, but mental, spiritual, psychological, emotional. I think that is extremely overlooked. This kids being on iPads all day, the blue light. Like if you, if you don't understand what blue light does to the body yet, you like, you got to catch up. Like if you're a coach listening to this and you don't understand how blue light is impacting your players, you got to get caught up on that. Um, blue light is literally killing our bodies. Um, you know, what, what else, Chris? Um, you know, chairs, I mean, just a chair, <laughs> let's face it. Yeah. There you go. The amount yeah. of sitting, right. Chairs. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, like you could even have something like, like if we're still talking about kind of like, you know, internal, like, um, like gut, gut health, you know, like your, your gut is extremely powerful. And, and like, if your gut is out of whack, then your brain and body is going to go into this sympathetic state. It's going to go into this fight or flight response. And that is a protective perception of threat type state. It's, it's all, it's elevated constantly. And that's a whole other you know topic. We could spend a whole podcast just on that alone. And so it's not as simple as just hamstrings are tight. I got to stretch the hamstrings. You've got to address the perception of threat. And that can take a while. Like that can really take a while. So like, I, I know one of the things that I make all our athletes do is like, you are required to have your phone like night shift on all day. Right. Like not, not dark mode, right? Like night shift. And like, I, I do the muscle testing, <laughs> like, like I'll literally muscle test them. If a muscle, like an indicator muscle is working, like then great. I'll have them hold, I'll hold up a phone that's got night shift on, like, so it's active, so it blocks the blue light. I will test again and it always, it always works. The muscle always stays strong. Flip the night switch, night, night, uh, night shift off, have them look at it, muscle test again, boom, leg goes weak right. and boom, everything tightens back up. Um, so I'm, I'm a big blue light type of type of guy. I think that's a huge stressor we can eliminate and the perception of threat we can eliminate. Well, I think we actually mentioned, uh, red and infrared a couple of weeks ago in its, in its, uh, recovery effects. So this is kind of the, you know, again, we're talking, by the way, when we say blue light, you're referring to the actual wavelength of light yes. blue that, um, that, uh, or too much of it is uh is detrimental and most of the time your screens are yes are blue lit and uh you're right they uh keeping that keeping that phone on night shift which by the way is a very good advice i mean i've been keeping that practice for about a year and a half now it's on night shift all the time and it uh i think it's it's a great idea yeah i mean you can't <laughs> You got to give it a few days, but after that, like you literally can't even go back and look at, like, I, I can't look at a normal screen right. anymore. It, it gives me a headache. Um, you'll have to bring Dr. Uh, Dr. Brandon on, um, Dr. Brandon Wally for anybody that's listening. And, and Doc, if you're listening, um, text me. Uh, we, uh, this, I think this would be a really cool topic to go over. Chris, you've met Dr. Brandon, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing a lot of, doing a lot of work and research into that. And I think it's really powerful um, and for sure. Uh, I'm trying to think what other, like what other stressors, um, that well, we actually can I, let me, um, interject and go back because coming back to the stretching, um, and Chris and John, you guys can kind of explain how you each address this because I at least hear people come in and they'll tell you, you know, that they stretch and they see an improvement they think in their flexibility mm -hmm. mobility. Oh, you know, when I stretch my hamstrings, it gets better. What can you tell people what is actually happening when they're doing that um, and why it's m probably not what they think? Well, a lot of times, you know, as John was saying earlier, most of the any time you stretch, 
most of the any kind of the uh, tissue changes are not happening in the muscle itself. It's you know the muscles themselves have to stay connected to each other. That's if you know anything about cross bridges, you know, in, in muscle. If if they get disconnected, they don't work. <laughs> you can't have a muscle that doesn't work. So it's usually the the fascia, the connective tissues, you know, perhaps the tendons, you know, can can certainly lengthen to a certain degree. That said, they also that's also very temporary. So um, as a result, yes, you stretch the hamstrings. You feel better. The next day, uh, it they're right back to where they were. Um, I know John has dealt with some, uh, you know, sacroiliac issues, and it feels better temporarily, yeah. frequently, but it actually makes it worse. You know, within, yeah, within an hour, absolutely. it's worse. So, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, again, they're they're locking down to try to stabilize that joint. Um, I got to, I got to, let me flip through my papers here. I got it somewhere. I've got a really good quote um, it, just about that. Uh where are you? Uh, yeah. So like the, the effects of stretching on the viscoelasticity of a muscle are real short lived. And so, you know, the stretching doesn't make significant change to the muscle, like improvements of flexibility are due more to a stretch tolerance rather than a change in the physical state. And that actually comes from Dr. Andrea Spina and his work with uh, you know, FRC and functional range conditioning. And, um, I've always saved that quote cause I really liked it. I mean, the literature like clearly shows it like it, stretching does not change the actual physical structure there all right it's more like okay this this idiot keeps putting me into this position and so i'm gonna finally let you go down a little bit otherwise you're gonna blow out your hamstring when in reality what's actually happening is the muscle spindles actually start firing even harder to protect you from actually lengthening out but again that's kind of why it gets tight again later on um you know and, and so i, I think I think it's it's important that we actually look into the research of why you know this you know why why people still feel that stretching has to be done, especially like during like or like before a game. Mm -hmm. That I was mean, my next question: How do you how do, how do you talk <laughs> to coaches and parents and even the athlete that feels they still need to stretch prior to an activity? And Chris, I mean, if you if you know the exact numbers, I don't, I can't remember the exact numbers, and it's it's somewhere, but. They, they showed that like static stretching prior to an prior to like a physical activity, like a game, I think it decreased like rate of force production in the muscle right. by something like 60% or something. Is that right? Yeah. I don't remember the numbers either, but yes, you're absolutely right. As far as the fact that it does do it to what degree I, I I'm with you. I don't remember exact numbers, but yes, I mean, you, it basically weakens you, uh, at least temporarily. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, right. it's, um, Kind of like what we we're talking about with the blue lit screen. It may not last long, but it's still going to weaken you for a period of time. And so, um, really, not a whole lot of reason to uh, to do you know passive range of motion. Um, you know, the passive range of yeah. stretching. Excuse me. Um, yeah, and, and I think with with pre game, so I think with pre game stuff too, like understanding a little more of the science behind why it's why it's very ineffective is. Because when you when you look at what the muscle spindles actually do, okay, and you know, and and how it's going to try to help prevent the muscle from pulling. Sorry, there's a bug flying. <laughs> uh, how to keep the muscle from actually pulling and tearing, okay. So what ends up happening is as you continue to reach for like that extra range of motion, like we talked about, the stretch is actually going to come from the connective tissues and they start to weaken. And so ultimately, you're actually setting yourself up for success by weakening these connective tissues. And so <laughs> what and, and it what actually happens is there's like this refractory period that occurs afterwards. And it's literally where the exact opposite of what was originally occurring in the tissue happens. So like if the contraction occurred during the stretch, you know, what's going to happen afterwards. And, and of course there's not going to be any contraction. And so like, so as you're trying to run or jump, whatever, the contractions that you actually need to help propel your body forward are actually less than they were before you stretched. So it's like, it's literally the exact opposite. And this refractory period, it's a problem because like it significantly decreases your ability to create and absorb force. And so when the muscles are unable to absorb force, you know, we know that that is the muscle has to absorb force. If it can't, the force is going to transfer into the surrounding connective tissues and it's eventually going to cause, you know, something to, to break down. So how do we get mobility without stretching? You talked about passive versus active range of motion and, you know, people being able to utilize their full range of of motion mm -hmm. how do you 
how do you get that mobility without stretching? You try and- well, I, I think again, mobility and flexibility. All right. What's that, Chris? You go ahead. I, I interrupted you. Go oh, ahead. no, I was going to say train through it. I mean, so you are, um, why, yes. why do you think we, going back to our ISO extreme uh, podcast, um, you know, you're training through ranges of motion now, and you, you would go into these positions and you would say, well, I feel this straight, you know, they point to an area, I feel this stretch. So uh, let's just use an ISO extreme lunge, for example, your mm-hmm. back, the hip flexor in the back leg is going to be lengthening but that's different than passive stretching because your glute on that side the the hip extensor Mm -hmm. is shortening they have this this communication effect between the two of them as a result glute shortens it sends a direct signal to the hip flexor hey you better lengthen you let me have this all right now the hip flexor doesn't let go it just lengthens so you can train in the range of motion by training the opposite to train the opposite side to shorten is that if that makes sense uh to get strong to no, that makes sense yeah yeah no absolutely yeah. we talked about that in the iso yep. episode I, I think as well and that's kind of the whole point is like you actually you have to engage and so i i think you know the difference in flexibility versus the mobile i think chris you're right like you they're different, but they're almost kind of the same too. Like, cause as that tissue lengthens, yes, you're going to be able to get deeper into that position. But I think we can also go deep into the mobility component when you're looking at like capsular restriction as well, you know? And so like, you know, with the understanding of how the mechanoreceptors in the joint actually fire, you know, um, you know, it's my personal belief that, you know, mechanoreceptors, mechanoreceptors sense load and so within the joint you have one of the more powerful mechanoreceptors because it it doesn't it doesn't skip the spinal cord so you know if you're listening it doesn't technically do that but it basically kind of bypasses that decision maker and goes right up into the into the nervous system and so by having proper articular control or proper joint control and joint movement your brain is understanding like hey this joint can go through this full range of motion and so like an elbow where we get stuck in like this hinge, okay? An elbow is probably a bad example. We get stuck in this hinge pattern. By going through these bigger ranges of motion, we show the joint receptors like, hey, you can go through all of this range of motion. And so that protective nature is going to kind of relax down a little bit. I think, it, it, you know, um, innately because your your nervous system understands like, hey, this joint can go through this range of motion. So I think that's also going to help just naturally you know, lengthen the tissue. That doesn't mean there doesn't have to be like an ISO extreme or something in there later to help train it. But I think if you look at that neurological component by reducing that perception of threat, again, letting the nervous system and the joint receptors know, hey, I can go through this range of motion. All these muscles don't have to be just super locked down all the time to try to stabilize it because it's worried about, you know, my arm, you know, exploding when I throw or something. Then I think you've already established another step in the right direction to lengthen the, you know, to to lengthen the tissue out and, and or gain more mobility in that capsule too. All right. So besides ISO extremes, um, you know, we talked about doing joint movements, things like that, removing that perceived threat. Are there other exercises, drills, movement patterns that you can give to these athletes and, and coaches to, to help improve mobility with their athletes? Well, I mean, I, I know some manual techniques work well. I mean, even if it's if it's self-directed, uh, which we do a lot with with some of our athletes with muscle activation. Um, uh, you know, there's some more manual techniques. You know, neuro targeting, um, square one. I mean, which you know, we we hope to get a lot of these practitioners on this podcast in the future. And these are more central nervous system directed removal of threat. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. So it would it would address, you know, like John was talking about, you know, like we're using a specific joint example. Of course, that is central nervous system driven also, but but um this would be Well it comes back to that perceived threat. Correct. It comes back the the, the removing the removing of that stress. Correct. And a lot of times and here's what's crazy. Yes, there's, there's, you know, yes, we can actually move the joint that we're referring to as in the case of ISO extremes or in the case of, you know, m- you know, multiple direction joint mobility um, and, and that sort of thing. But a lot, 
so many things that remove the threat don't even necessarily involve moving that joint that feels tight, which is crazy. Right. Right. You know, I would have, you know, 20 years ago, I would have been like, what? You know, and now it's like, okay, I've seen it enough times. Okay. It, this is crazy, but it's real. So mm-hmm. tap your head and your hamstrings loosen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Some weird, <laughs> yeah. Some weird stuff like that. You know, by the way, you know, there's going to be now, of course, Mandy, people are going to go try that. But I that was a total All joke. Right. There's no scientific evidence that says if you tap your head, your hamstrings will lengthen. Well, just disclaimer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but you know, yeah, but there's here's what's funny, Mandy. For somebody out there, it's gonna work. For right, somebody right. Out there, like, that's gonna right. Work. So you know, it's uh, that, so that's as crazy as that sounds. That's gonna reduce somebody's threat. But anyway, that's uh, mm-hmm. but the point is, is that there's there's some of these techniques that are very legitimate and even if they're not mainstream, okay, I, I'm going to be very careful to say that because they're not necessarily mainstream techniques. Doesn't mean they don't work. Okay. That does not mean they don't work <laughs> They're, uh, but it's crazy increases range of motion. As John was saying, you know, muscle tests, something that makes a muscle test weak. You could do something as simple as, you know, change the light environment and they go strong or they go weak or they go, you know, they go tight or they go, you know, and it's all the perception. So, uh, Mm -hmm. so I'm actually going to go with, uh, if we can figure out ways, regardless of what those techniques are to reduce threat, we can improve a lot of things all at one time. Strength, range of motion, coordination, fill in the blank. I think we can do a lot more. Uh, with a lot of athletes yeah. that way. Yeah. So, John, yeah. I hear you coach a lot with your athletes when they talk about <laughs> one of my favorite questions is playing through pain. Like, how, you know, should I throw this weekend? My elbow hurts. Should I play in my soccer game? My knee hurts. And that sounds to me like it could correlate back to the tightening of muscles and potential causing or worsening of an injury because of that reason right there you you pain in the body is an obvious stressor um Mm -hmm. would you can would you attribute that to decreasing mobility if you allow if you are as a coach or a player allow yourself to play through pain so to speak well i I mean the first part of that the the first answer is obviously going to be you know if something hurts i mean get it looked at clearly i mean so you know as long as you know you've got the you know the understanding or the healthcare provider doctor trainer whoever you know has has looked at it you know the healthcare provider said okay yeah you know there's no damage here and you're not going to damage it by doing anything you know more than i think obviously that's number one got to get that taken care of so in that scenario say that you know they say yes it's it's okay like it's 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 a touchy subject because whenever there is pain, there is, there's going to be a rerouting. So right. the, the nervous system is going to try to reroute in an or in an order to protect. And so like, it's just hard to answer. I feel like there, there's a difference in like a, um, like, a, like a bump or an ache or a bruise and like in a pain that is due to, you know, like some type of cortical imbalance, like where, you know, the, for example, your knee hurts and yes, doctor said everything is fine. You know, there's nothing going on. There's just some inflammation you know, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt too bad. You're fine. If that's the scenario, then yeah, you got to dig into, okay, well, what, why is that actually there? You know, if you didn't have 300 pound lime and hit you. So like, yeah, the, the quad or the iliacus, you know, might not be firing and that might be due, you know, to a cortical imbalance. So, you know, the nervous system is not able to communicate to get the muscle to absorb the force and the force is traveling into that knee. Um, you know, and, and that's, what's ultimately creating that inflammation. So, I mean, we see that a lot, you know, whereas medically there's, you know, it's just inflamed. There's not a you know, major injury or anything there yet, you know, but it, it's right. ultimately, okay. These areas are not firing, not absorbing force, force transfers into that area. And yes, that, that would absolutely create tightness and things like that around it because it's going to try to protect. I, I don't know if that answer, did that answer no, your it question? Does, and it actually kind of goes back. It brought me back to Chris's original story about the guy with the motorcycle injury, mm-hmm. you know? There was clearly yeah. an injury there, a threat, yeah. something going on. I, I think one of the other things that we you taught you asked was like asking about methods to improve you know your flexibility range of mm-hmm. motion. And 
But I think we need, Chris, I think, you know, we wouldn't be doing everybody justice, justice here if we, if we didn't at least mention PNF and what mm-hmm. it is and how that works. And so, you know, for those that don't know, PNF is, it stands for proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And it's, it is, it is pretty popular and there, there can be benefits. So basically what PNF is, is that for all intents and purposes, it's kind of like a contract release. Okay. You know, there, there's a little bit more to it as far as time and different range of motions. We're not, we don't need to get into all that right now, but it's basically a contract and release type of method. So like, you know, a practitioner, you know, or doctor or, you know, PT or whoever would be, you know, passively stretching, you contract and then relax, go through range of motion and you'll see it improve. Okay. Because again, we talked about the refractory period where something contracts and the opposite is going to happen in a minute. It'll relax. But what ends up happening is people will ask, okay, well, PNF, or, or I see this a lot, PNF increases the range of motion, but then it goes back, you know, maybe it lasts longer than a static stretch, but it goes back to the shortened state here, you know, in what, I don't know, two, three days. I don't know, Chris, you're, you're right. with the metal medical background well, there. The, the um, original, I've know. got, I think I have the original textbook on PNF. Um, so yes, mm-hmm. you, you're, you're right. Probably the most, the most, um, utilized form of, of PNF is a contract relax where, you know, let's say you're, let's say someone's stretching the hamstring and, you know, they push down like they're trying to push their, they're laying on their back, you know, legs up in the air, like foots up toward the ceiling. They push down to the therapist's shoulder like they're trying to push their leg back down to the table, contract the hamstring, then, yeah. then relax it. That's only one PNF technique. Um, I think the more effective one was the slow reversal hold. That's where they contracted the hamstring, yes, against a static load like the therapist's shoulder or something like that. But then the, then the actual client or patient or whoever would actually reverse it, turn on their quad muscle or their their quad hip flexor, and then pull it back themselves. Does that make sense? Okay, mm-hmm. so that was actually yeah. a P, the one of the original PNF techniques that's rarely used. Um, however, if you mm-hmm. look in sports like gymnastics, um, good yo- I'll call it good yoga. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think Pilates, I'm not, I don't know much about Pilates, but, um, but I would, I would say, I think Pilates, they actually utilize that concept a lot more. Mm -hmm. They, and, uh, you know, I I am familiar with gymnastics in the sense that my son is a gymnastics coach. So they utilize a lot of the, of the PNF, the, the contract, not contract relax, but the reversal hold technique where they actually engage your quad to stretch your hamstring, which goes back to the same concept mm-hmm. as the ISO extreme. You know, okay? it's the same right. idea. Yep. So, you know, <clears throat> it's, um, so yoga, Pilates, ISO extremes, <laughs> once again, they all utilize a lot of the same useful techniques, um, in my opinion. So, uh, that, uh, the, so the, the contract relaxes, really only one small bit of PNF yet it gets used more than anything, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And I think the reason, the reason that it doesn't, it won't hold is because it it boils down to a time thing. And that, that I think is a very misunderstood concept is, you know, you ultimately have to reeducate. All right. And so neuromuscular reeducate. But there's a window of time that has to occur before the nervous system truly recognizes and accepts the change, so to speak. Okay. That window, basically you could start around three minutes. All right. And and so people always wonder, why do we do things for three to five minutes? Well, there you go. There's your answer. Okay. Because it's enough time for the nervous system to actually realize what's going on realize there's not necessarily a perception of threat and actually make the adaptation. All right. And so a lot of times you'll do PNF where people say, Oh, I do this and I do, you know, contract release, contract release, but it doesn't stay. It's because it's not enough time. It, there has to be the time it gets to reeducate, you know, the, the myelination factors, you know, that play a role in all that. So the brain and, and the body can understand, look, I can hold that range of motion and I can, you know, I can do that safely. And so, you know, like with us, that's where, you know, pales rails comes in or progressive and gre- regressive re- or progressive and regressive angular isometrics. And again, that's, that's a FRC. That's a Dr. Spina thing. I'm not, I don't take, I'm not taking credit for that. 
um, you know, we're FRC and FRA certified. And I think they're both, and actually we've gone through the kin stretch program too. And I think, I think it's all, it's all good stuff. So I want to give Dr. Spina credit, you know, where it's due, you know, where it's due, cause he's definitely put that to the forefront, but it's one of the things that we talk about in order to change the actual tissue quality, to change the capsular, um, you know, a, a components to it is, it's not just PNF, but it's, it's long endurance, like long endurance isometric. So you track release, then it's almost a trainable feat, which is kind of what you were talking about too, Chris, like you've got to do it for time. Um, and that, that's just, that's a critical part of it. If you're going to use that mm -hmm. component, I think, would you, would you agree or disagree? Oh, absolutely. With that, I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a firm believer in, uh, in things like ice in ISO extremes. And as a result, mm -hmm. I mean, three minutes is the yeah. minimum, <laughs> You know, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, no. And you know, the other easiest way is just going to be slap the newbie on it and, uh, and loosen it up with the newbie. And that's really the simple yeah, solution right there. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think one of the things I know it's not really on our, you know, kind of our notes to discuss, but I, I want to make sure we hit on the point of, I, th I feel like there's a misconception that w if we say, if we're talking about not stretching, like that doesn't mean not warming up. Like there's a big difference between yes. the two. So like, what do you do? if you're not going to stretch well dynamic warm-up is is great like that's what you do to warm up you know i'm i won't go maybe we'll do a dynamic warm-up episode because like i think a skips and b skips are complete bullshit they're a waste of time you know high knees but that's a different story but there are other dynamic warm-up things you can do so if you like a skips and b skips cool whatever go for it high knees you know all that your frankenstein's that di well maybe not frankenstein's but you know your your other dynamic jumping jacks go for it that's what gets the body temperature up sure that gets blood flow going that's all good stuff I would prefer you do extreme isometrics instead and, you know, maybe some drops or some cars or something like that. But just because we say don't stretch, that doesn't mean don't warm up. Right. Right. And once again, I still think it's, that's still more neural neurological preparation more so than is muscular, which I mean, the neural does yeah. the muscular, not, you know, not the other way around. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, uh, I guess, t take home message, to, you know, yep. to, to wrap this thing up here. So for, you know, parents or athlete listening to this or coach listening, you know, where, where y'all need to go. I, I mean, how about this? How about this simple answer? Why don't you guys stretch or why? <laughs> what I know this entire episode <laughs> explained that, yeah. but if you had to give a nice, concise, um, elevator answer to why we don't stretch what what would you say because it's ineffective and there are a whole lot more efficient ways to gain range of motion That's i don't want to be weaker all right <laughs> there. okay hey. there you go yeah one of my favorite quotes used to be uh you know would you loosen the lug nuts on your ferrari before you went out and drove there you go the nice yeah like it. yeah 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 yeah, like yeah. That yeah that's, a, that's a dan victor one right yeah, there so yeah dan, dan i stole that Dan, yeah. I stole yeah. that from you, but it's okay. Hey, Dan, if you're listening to this, we know you're coming on soon because I know that you stole you. I never gave you my permission to use, <laughs> use my story of when I was down in Birmingham and we met and you did your good side, bad side stuff with me. I hear you in your seminars share that story all the time, Dan. So I will bring that up again. So if you stole that from me, I'm going to steal your quote. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> but do you remember that? Oh, do you remember yeah. that, Chris? Do you remember oh, yeah. we were down there? Yeah, that was good stuff. But yeah, I, I mean, just. You know, it, it's an outdated, it's an outdated methodology. It's something that's just been passed on from generation to generation to generation, it, you know, and it's, it, it's ineffective. And I think when you, I, I hate to see these pro teams and things like that still doing this, like these guys still daggum static stretching before a game. And it's like, don't you think that maybe if injury rates are like at an all time high, that maybe somebody's got the thought that you can. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't be doing something like that. Maybe we should actually redirect a little bit. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm asking too much of other people. <laughs> yeah. so, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, so, yeah. So if you're, if you're ta your take home for your coach, your, you know, your parent, your athlete, dynamic warm up. Okay. Dynamic warm up, warm tissue up before you get going. Absolutely. All right. You want to do something like cars or things like that to help, you know, help get your joints. So there's all kinds of stuff out there. You can, you can go to our YouTube page. There's some videos on how to do some baseline cars. Okay. There's also 10,000 videos out there that you could watch learn how to do that. All right. But then also get strong. Okay. So, you know, get, 
into these extreme isometrics, learn how to maintain position, get back chain dominant, which is something we can talk about another day as well. Get back chain dominant, take a look at your biomechanics, okay? That's, you know, something we, you know, we can help you with, but the baseline is warm up, do some ISOs and get strong. And that will initially help the process of changing flexibility. And then other, then look at the stressors. So what else in your life can you eliminate from a stress standpoint that could be potentially causing the muscles to lock down? Yeah. Chris? No, agreed. All very good. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. Mandy, you got anything else? No, guys. I, I think that's the show right there. Yeah, that's pretty much the show. So, uh, yeah, Mandy, uh, t tell everybody again how they can get in touch with us. Well, if you have any other questions that uh, you'd like us to address, like I said, info at EliteLevelPerformance.com. Uh, also, feel free to send us comments, likes, dislikes, whatever. You know, just be nice. Uh, you, we can go to our website, www.EliteLevelPerformance.com, um, and we're on all the social, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. They're all pretty much elite level performance. Uh, you'll be able to find us. Um Chris, Chris your, your your touch with you, yeah, just the yeah. uh, best way just through Instagram. It's uh, fast underscore and underscore agile underscore four nine. <laughs> so, yeah, it's nice and easy there. Fast and agile 49. And yeah. that's, uh, that's probably the best way to find me. Cool. Cool. Well, that's the show, guys. I uh, appreciate everybody for listening. Uh, you know, remember the show that is, this is something we're doing to give back to our community. We're, you know, we're not making any money off this. We spent a lot of money on, but we're not making <laughs> money off this, you know. So there is a fee, though. And, and that fee is we do ask that you share this show. Like we're doing this for the community. We want to get this information out to you guys. So please share the show. The more you share it, the more this information gets out there and the more we'll keep doing it. Um, you know, we'll keep bringing you guys more and more content. Um, you know, to help you guys win. Cause that's what it's all about. The, the, we don't want or need anything for this. We, we just want to see you win. Um, that's the, that's the whole point of this. So share the show, please. Social media be great, man. Social media, get it out there. Tell your friends, tell your coaches, tell your parents. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's the show and we will see you guys, uh, next, next time. time. Thanks. Thanks guys. Have a good one.